Hello and welcome to another episode of the PD Performance Podcast. I'm sitting here with Jennifer Dunn of the Brisbane Lions and the Dublin Ladies Gaelic Football Team. So we had a lot to talk about, about her championship win last year with Dublin and her premiership win with the Lions. And now the current season as well, as Dublin entered the championship. Loads in this episode about SNC, about the mental attitude you need in elite sport, about professionalism versus amateurism. So I hope you enjoy it. And if you do enjoy it, please remember to like it, share it and send it. Jennifer Dunn, welcome to the PD Performance Podcast. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Mel. Yeah. How are you doing today? Uh, good. Yeah, all good. Just, um, I was saying today, I've obviously been working a little bit at the moment since coming home at Christmas. So um, I'm a teacher technically by trade. So um, primary school. Um, so got a career break to obviously get the opportunity to go to Australia. But at the moment, I'm just subbing a few days. So that keeps me busy. And yeah, just said I'd come in and do this today. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Excited to have you in. We've had quite a few of your connections and your mm -hmm. teammates on. So it's great to get you here for this chat. And as well as that, we were speaking previously when you were in Sydney on a little holiday yeah. to try and put it together after you guys won the comp. Yeah. But how nice is it to do it in your favourite place of all, <laughs> Dublin? Um, yeah, no, it is great. Obviously, I'm happy to be home um, at Christmas. I feel like as Irish people, even chatting to the girls in Australia, I feel like Christmas here is so different to how people celebrate Christmas abroad. So coming home and seeing everyone and uh, just, yeah, reconnecting with people was really nice and definitely just used to the Irish weather and the routine of life back here now for sure. Um, so yeah. Did much change in the time that you were away and you came no. back or is it the exact no, same? No, it's the exact same. It's so funny. Now I only was gone for four months, but um, even the few days I was back, you're just back doing the same thing, meeting the same people. And like, I loved it. And I missed obviously everyone when I did go over. Um, I definitely found the first few weeks in Australia hard just from homesick point of view and things like that. But coming home, obviously everyone's still here doing the same thing. Um, so yeah, you feel like when you're away, you think you're missing out on so much, but having come back now, um, it's kind of, yeah, still the same, but enjoying it um, at the same time. It was probably harder on you in the way that you went from such like a peak mm -hmm. of winning the All-Ireland and then having a the couple of days afterwards and then like you're on a plane that week yeah. and gone. Yeah, that definitely. So you're like having so much fun with everyone and then you're like, okay, bye. Yeah, um, I kind of laughed with a few of the girls now that I'm back, kind of the, the dramatics nearly of the kind of following few days. Obviously, you work so hard with a certain group and we were lucky enough to win um, last year, but I always knew that I was probably going to have to leave quite quickly after the competition finished, regardless whether that was the final, semi-final, quarter-final. So yeah, Sunday was the game and then I had a few days of celebrating and whatnot. But yeah, I came around to that Wednesday and uh, I was on a flight and I actually even, like I think back of it now, it's probably one of the worst days of my life, nearly just, it was, yeah, everyone was on such a somber kind of mood. We'd come off such a high and it was as if it was just everyone calling to the house saying goodbye and it was just a weird atmosphere, I guess, because everyone knew that I was leaving. Obviously, I was so excited, but I was also going into something completely unknown. So um, even for my family and friends, like close friends, it was, yeah, a weird one. But I had to just sit on a flight then for 20 hours nearly, just reflecting through nearly images and pictures and memories from the last few days. And obviously, I was so glad I would have rather been on the plane having won than lost. But um, yeah, definitely tricky all the same. Yeah, 20 hours by yourself after that is interesting to say mm -hmm. the least did it ever cross your mind on the flight like oh god have I made the right decision here or were you kind of a little bit excited to get out to Brisbane as well I think once I got on the flight I'd like I couldn't turn around at that stage um <laughs> definitely <laughs> sorry in the, yeah no but definitely in the few days in the lead up obviously I hadn't really thought much about it with the game being on the Sunday I tried to just focus my attention on that so even elements of just packing and different bits and bobs that you kind of have to normally put at the forefront of your mind I definitely pushed away so the la like the day before was hectic then trying to organise last minute bits but um, I think once I was on the flight I just had to accept that it was going to happen obviously I had time to process it a little bit more in advance especially when I signed originally but um, I definitely didn't think of it a huge amount say the week before and it nearly only hit me then essentially when I was on the plane I was I kind of knew and accepted that I was going to be landing in Brisbane and that would be me for the next three four months or whatever How long before you left, did the girls know that you were leaving? The Dublin girls? Yeah. Um, so once the, the news came out, I think back in March, so kind of just around this time last year nearly, um, obviously 
prior to that, you're having conversations with people and just trying to decide what you want and what's best for me. Um, so I would have spoken to Mick, the Dublin manager and different people just because I would have rather them hear it from me than through someone else. And um, for me, I just wanted them to even know that I was considering it. So I spoke to him a little bit. Obviously, he was super supportive and then would have chatted to a few of the girls that have gone over before. Um, and then essentially, once I did decide to sign, before the news was officially announced, I obviously told most of the girls on the team just so they knew that this is what was going to happen. Obviously, I was sticking it out with them for the year, but I was going on to this do this exciting journey and get this opportunity afterwards. I feel like as Irish people, we're so wound up with what others think. And I think for me, nearly keeping that a secret up until it came out was a challenge. Um, I was just really anxious and nervous about what people thought. And because there's so many Irish going over every year, it's you kind of wonder, everyone has opinions on it. Some people love it, some people don't enjoy it as much. So I definitely was just worried about what my closest friends would think. And obviously they're super supportive, but um, once the news was actually formally announced and everyone knew, it was like a weight off my shoulders. But I remember listening to, I think Neve McLaughlin said similar when she signed last year. She just said that the build up in the few days or weeks before it's actually announced is kind of terrifying because you know the news and no one else does. And then yeah, it's essentially, like I said, just you feel a bit of relief once it's out there because then it's not a secret and you know, don't feel like you're keeping it back from other people. So I would have told them like well early on, so probably like February, March of last year. Yeah. Why do you think we worry so much about what others and our teammates are going to think about leaving? Is it because perhaps in other countries, in other sports, you don't play for where you're from. So you just don't know any different. You don't know any other group, any other team. So it is kind of foreign to go and play for a different team, let alone a different sport altogether. Yeah, I think that's it. And I feel like I discovered definitely as Irish people, we worry a lot and we're obviously quite humble in our beings, but we yeah care a lot about what they think of us and nearly overthink at times and get stressed and wind up about different things. And could be something major in your mind, but the simplest thing to someone else. But I think definitely that point that, yeah, I guess we play for where we're from. And that was something I came to realise, obviously, having experienced professional setup abroad, like playing for Dublin and playing for your club. My club's cool. It takes such pride in it. It's from it's like you play for where you're from. You play with the people you've grown up with. You play with that kind of parish because my dad played with that parish and his dad played with that parish. So you're kind of born into it and that's the loyalty you have. So definitely the worry, I guess, probably was that I was telling people that I was leaving and then questions about my future with Dublin or future with different things would have popped up. But for me, I just was focused on the, like that present moment and just trying to get through that last year. And obviously, I nearly used it as ammunition to kind of push on and drive myself in the Dublin setup and not want people to use excuses of me signing or going elsewhere to, you know, hold against me. So um, once the news was out, I was, again, relieved and I could just park it and then focus on that. And then obviously when I went to Oz, that was my priority. So yeah, it's like two different worlds, really. It's so funny that you have to live so in the present mm -hmm. for each season all the time because everybody says, okay, next game, just focus on this season. Let's not look at what's down the road. But for both playing with Dublin and playing with Brisbane, you have to be so fully focused on it because it's a totally different sport. So you really yeah. have to focus in. And if one of the teams gets knocked out, which isn't like your fault because it's a team game. Your focus almost immediately shifts to the the other team and the next competition that's on the horizon. Like, yeah. Are you good at that, do you think? Uh, it was definitely something uh, that I probably came to nearly appreciate and understand more that being present in the moment. Um, when like I look, even looking at your questions and it was what's something that I've learned or, uh, from the last year of my journey is to be more present in the moment. Like when I was here with Dublin, obviously that was my focus. When I was in Brisbane, that was my focus. And as I said, now that I'm home, I'm looking at the girls in Australia and you feel like you're missing out on certain things as well and vice versa. So I feel like for me, I nearly had to just not com compartmentalize, but kind of separate my two lives and that when I'm here in Dublin, I need to you know, be present in that and work hard with what I'm doing here and be happy with that and content, which I am. And then when I'm in Australia, do the same. Because otherwise I feel if you're too caught up in what's been or gone or what's going to happen in the future, you miss the moment and then it passes you by. So I definitely felt once I got to Australia, I just accepted that and kind of rolled with it. And for those few months, it was an unbelievable journey, but definitely just accepting, yeah, being there in that moment and just appreciating it for what it is as well because you can get wound up in yeah, past events and look too far into the future at times as well. So definitely just 
yeah, being content with what's happening at the moment in your life is probably something I came to realise a lot more last year, having been exposed to the two setups and different lifestyles. It's probably easier to do that when you're winning. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know, I guess. Yeah, obviously. We'll see. But yeah, that's true. And this is a new year and, you know, you leave last year with the great accolades and obviously I'm super proud of them, but it's a clean slate. We start championship with Dublin now this week and the same with Brisbane. Like once the new year dawns, you know, you're back to square one. And as much as people will talk, still talk about you being all Ireland champions or like, you know, premiership winners, you know, as a group, I think both setups, you you don't want to carry that load with you. You want to start again and know that you have to build and you have to keep getting better and we have to be better in both setups this year to want to be successful again, I guess. How did you manage that transition from the end of the season and winning the championship to then just going straight into the start of another season? Because typically people say, okay, let's enjoy it. And then after a while, let's park it and focus on next season. But you have to do that a week. Yeah. <laughs> That's mental. Like, Yeah, it is a bit crazy. Like on the Sunday, obviously out celebrating, having a good time. And then the following Friday, been at a training session in 30 degree heat in Brisbane. So yeah, definitely just a, like a mindset shift. Um, Initially, when I, when I went over to Brisbane, obviously it was a completely new setup. I had been in touch with certain people, you know, as much as I could. But still, while I was here, Dublin was my focus. So once I arrived, I guess there's probably a few crash courses that you do. And I think as most of the Irish players come to realise is that, yeah, there are challenges in their game and it's just different. Obviously, the athleticism and kind of our basic skills are super transferable. But the ball and the unpredictability of that in itself is another yeah, a ball game, like it's crazy to think that changing the shape of the ball can change the game and how you view the game or even play the game. I even jokingly was saying to the girls, if we played AFL with the Gaelic ball, it would just be the most simple thing ever. But I guess that's their game and that's what you had to adapt to. So I definitely had a few days at the start of kind of maybe one-on-one -on -one coaching with a development coach and different things like that to slowly ease me in and, and integrate me in. Um, because obviously the competition was starting essentially two or three weeks later. so. I knew that I wouldn't be breaking in at the start and I didn't have any expectation to do that because of... It didn't the, take you long though either. No, not necessarily, I guess. Considering you missed the majority of the preseason and as you said, you arrived two or three weeks yeah, before the start like, of the season. I guess physically and athletically, probably I was fine. Um, and I think that's something that most of the Gaelic Irish girls bring over is that they're so well able to keep up with it. And the Australian girls always joke that the Irish are super fast and just really athletic. And I guess maybe just because we're used to our game here and how fast it is and, you know, just the conditioning we would do to, you know, play at an elite level here um, is super transferable in that sense. But definitely did a few bits, even the kicking, the handballing, all that stuff uh, definitely took time and I'm still not a pro at it at all. But I guess I just wanted to work hard. And then when I was given my opportunity to play, I just wanted to, you know, give it my all. I wasn't going to let, you know, the fact that it was an unknown game, as daunting as it was, and I definitely, the first game I played, even with the rotations and the way the game works, it was quite overwhelming. I had to ask people a hundred times just to be sure I knew what I was at. Um, in case, because you don't want to make mistakes and feel like as Irish people, I think our work ethic and our kind of approach to that playing a sport in a different sport is what's kind of so likable in a sense and so many of the Irish girls do well at it over there because they're so open-minded to you know learn and I appreciate like I, I understood I had to learn fast because that was the way it was but um yeah everyone was super helpful over there and even the girls and stuff had patience which was great because at times I knew I was probably you know making them feel a certain way and maybe frustrating them but I guess that was well, what, what they were you do yeah that You're was what they were gonna best, get like. yeah bringing an Irish girl in and they had had Orla obviously who's been super successful at the game over there and is an insane athlete in herself so I lived with her which was super um just to have her to even chat to and lean on and just draw from her experience as well of what she found hard and what she found worked for her and that was you know so helpful for me as well sounds like she gave you a lot of pep talks yeah a few I feel like for her, I think she liked having another Irish person around as well because she's been the only Irish one there um, for, I think, three or four years now. So we're actually similar in a lot of ways as well. And we both just kind of are hardworking people. And she obviously had huge success with Tipperary when she was here as well. So um, I think just having a lot of similarities in common, common ground just helped us get on really well. And she, yeah, she's obviously taken to the game super. So I was able to just ask her anything and felt I could just 
you know, something that maybe I didn't feel I could ask an Australian player or someone like that, I could ask Orla. And she was quite honest and open, even in and the way she put felt it at in times. the way you'd understand yeah, as well. The language and stuff was something that I initially the first day, I think the first they were doing a match sim game or a friendly game and I just sat in on it and it was it was as if they're speaking gibberish because it's just it's English, but it's just all the shortened words. And I'm sure you would know they they shorten everything. They have different phrases, different sayings, especially in footy terms, as they'd say. So I remember the first day I went in and I left. They're like, here's a notebook. Just write down any words or phrases you don't know. And I actually came out and it was nearly a full A4 page of just like little sayings or words or phrases that popped up regularly. And obviously by the end of it, then you're just used to it. But um, it's funny. But imagine bringing the girls to Dublin to a yeah. GAA session. I know. They wouldn't actually. Be no. Sure. And even the way we speak, like they thought I was so different to the way Orla sounds. And they obviously are exposed to a lot of Irish girls now in the competition. And they say it's funny how we all from the same place, but we all sound or can sound so different, um, which is also, yeah, something funny to kind of hear them say. So it sounds like the Aussie girls have been really welcoming and they've been great with you as well. But it's great that there's so many Irish girls over in the league because almost if you go into any organisation, there's going to be another Irish girl there for you to kind of help you integrate. Do you think that benefited you more so in that week or two weeks when you arrived having Orla there because it would have been very different if you arrived after winning the All-Ireland integrating with this group and it was just full of Australians that probably couldn't connect with you on the exact same level that Orla can by the sounds of things. Yeah, no, for sure. Like she even understood and appreciated what I probably had done the following days after the game because she'd won the All-Ireland, the Intermediate All-Ireland with Tipperary a few years ago and even talking to her about where we went on nights out and different things like that. And I think just the Irish culture in the GAA as a whole, she obviously would be so familiar with. So just even having chats with her about that or even every now and again, just chatting about Gaelic football or hurling or camogie in the house. Because again, we ended up having loads of mutual connections of people we knew through like through home. So it definitely helped a huge amount. And like that, if I wanted to just t- chat about something super normal that was happening at home that I saw maybe online or on Instagram, she was in the know with it and you could just have, yeah, really casual conversations. So it helped a lot. And now the Australians were all great and we lived with Aussie girls as well. And they came to know the Irish ways. It was nearly like the two of us were doing things that um, they got used to as well. But no, definitely helps. And I I obviously that is quite common across the competition now that there are nearly two, if not three um, players, I guess, that can lean on each other, which is a great thing. But obviously it's, yeah, becoming quite big, quite common. Do you think we'll move to a stage where they might cap the number of Irish players that go over or will it just come to like a natural cap anyway in that they've pulled as many really high caliber athletes over from our country into theirs and maybe rather than solely focusing on integrating great athletes into being great players they might need to get that balance right of great athletes and great players. Yeah, it's hard Not to... that the Irish girls aren't great players. <laughs> yeah. But as you said, you have to work on the skills initially <laughs> yeah. and they have to teach you a crash course in a new sport to yeah. get you into the team. Yeah, I don't know. It's hard to know. I think obviously there's probably a few new girls announced this year and things like that. I think for me, the opportunity to go over and see Australia and just even get to experience a professional setup was very enticing. So that's, I have family in Australia as well and I never have had the chance to go over prior. So just getting that opportunity to travel and see that part of the world also was kind of an element of it and deciding to go and stuff like that. But yeah, it's hard to know. I'm not sure. Um, I feel like there are so many Irish now, nearly the Australians are probably sick of us at times. Um, and I could see maybe sometimes, not that That's because frust- you don't go away well, yeah. when you're playing. Like. Yeah, and I don't know <laughs> if there's a frustration within that on their end, but like obviously most of the Irish that have gone over have been successful and have gotten into teams and broken into starting teams, which is great for us. But I guess for them, for people that are playing the game, you know, from a young age, it'd be like if someone came over from, I don't know, another country to play Gaelic football and then suddenly your team is, you know, made Picking up of, them, yeah. yeah, made up of more Australians or more, I don't even know, someone else um, than your own kind of um, grassroots players. It, yeah, I don't know. It's a hard one to call. I think it could be, there might be something down the line, but at the, at this moment, I think it's still... Um, it's still kind of new for most. So I think they'll just keep it as it is and see, I guess, with the growth of the game, if anything happens with it. But you were saying earlier you were a little bit worried because there is a little bit of chat from some corners of the internet around 
girls shouldn't be going over and leaving their clubs or leaving their counties and they should be continuing to play Gaelic football. But then from my travels out there, my experiences in with some of the teams, mm. any of the players that I talked to back here, and it's typically the male players, they're asking me all about what goes on inside an AFL setup. Yeah. And they're hearing everything that's on offer and they're like, oh, that's class. They're so jealous of all I the know. girls that are going out. Yeah. So that just shows you what an opportunity it is, as you just said. And you can't criticise girls for taking that opportunity to go and be a professional athlete no, yeah. and live in Australia. Yeah. Like, it's unreal. Yeah, no, and it is such an exciting time for anyone in their life and if they do decide to do it. The one thing though I would say is that like, from what I've experienced with the Dublin setup, even professionalism standards wise, I'm so fortunate to be in that setup and obviously the money and the professionalism and having the luxury of training during the day because everyone, you know, it's your job over in Australia like the way the two teams carried themselves was so on par. And even when I've come back to Dublin, obviously the main difference I've just found is just everyone has to go to work on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, we still train nearly the same amount of time. Obviously, we don't have the luxury of going in to do a recovery bit or spend longer in the facilities. But um, I was I actually thought it was really interesting that it was so similar and that it's kind of a credit to Dublin GA, I guess, as a whole, is that it's not that far off what an elite professional setup is like, um, apart from obviously the luxury of having maybe better facilities and also more coaches, more maybe. coaches and not having to have another job. Um, but I think if like over here with the GEA, I think again, the love of the game is what pe- keep people doing it. And even that's why I wanted to stay and play and, you know, that kind of way is because you have a loyalty to your club, you have a loyalty to your county. And um, I knew I was still going to go back to a, professional setup even though there's no money involved and again the topic of money comes up a lot with the Australian players and would they ever think of they couldn't get over how we play in all Ireland finals in front of 45,000 people and it's all voluntary like the girls couldn't get over that Um, but again I just said it's for the love of the game it's for the pride that you have in playing for your county and just kind of the culture we've adopted here and I don't think anyone would have it any other way really either. That's interesting that you say that because some Previous guests have said that it may go the way of some yeah. sort of professionalism, but I I just can't see it happening. I can't see players being paid. I can see better opportunities being mm-hmm. given to players as a result of playing, which I think happens anyway, but yeah. I can't see them being played. And that was something that I did want to touch on with you because when you do something for the love of it and for the pursuit of it, yeah. it is extremely enjoyable to go and do it it's your release whereas then when you start being rewarded for it like with money or like financially sometimes it can be a job did it ever feel like a job playing AFL? No like I think every now well yes um, not really and I think the funny thing was anytime then obviously I got my first pay slip I just kind of laughed and I was like oh my god I've just got paid for (laughs) Doing what, Do what I love, I anyway. which is playing sport and being competitive. So, like, obviously there are huge differences in that element. And I think when there's more money involved, it can be, you know, a blessing and a curse at times. But um, I love playing with Dublin and playing Gaelic because, as you said, I've played it since I was four, five, six, and I know no different. Then I also loved the opportunity and the challenge of playing a new sport. And obviously when you're playing Gaelic for so long and you come to a stage where you feel like you know the game inside and out obviously it's nice to go over and try something new and essentially learn how to walk again and that was frustrating at times for sure and I think a lot of the Irish find that because you're going over being good at something one of the best in the team to like yeah yeah rock bottom almost immediately yeah being you know yeah back to square one yeah so that was definitely a challenge but again it's something that I think Irish players really take well to and they nearly relish the challenge obviously it's you know brings its own different things that come up and people find it hard and there are times where I was going home after training really frustrated or felt like I wasn't going to get a chance to play and things like that but um, I think they see something in the Irish players that they obviously are interested in and that's what draws them to want to sign them and things like that so I feel like as Irish players it's just really important to bring what you can to the table and what they saw as kind of attributes in your game that you can nearly transfer over and that's probably what most try to do and Yeah, there's a bit of unpredictability with that in itself, but that probably adds to the flair that all the Irish players do have. That's kind of what Neve Kelly was saying Mm. in maybe her first foray into it. She 
was trying things that she wasn't necessarily the strongest at and she you have to do that mm-hmm. to try to learn lessons and develop as an athlete but then last year in like her best year yet she really just focused in on doing what she does well and mm-hmm. the reason that she was recruited putting that into practice on the field are you aware of what the reason was you were recruited are you told that fairly frequently and then um, does it play into the instruction that's given to you on the field of play I guess obviously I'm tall, so like over there, height is a huge advantage, whether you're a tall forward or a rock or even a tall back. So my height and maybe like just my physicality um, was something they saw. Um, obviously going over, I, even listening to Ailish on the podcast the last day, she's not too sure where she'll start off. I didn't know where I'd start off position wise. Obviously ended up finding myself in the backs, which I enjoyed, but I felt it was an easy place to kind of start from because I just had to be competitive in the air and just, you're actually, it's funny, even my first game, with a few kind of, you know, rust shoulders. Yeah, yeah, shoulders and whatnot you'd have afterwards. They were like, you know, you can actually be a lot more physical with it. But again, we're used to a certain level in Gaelic. And then when you come home to play Gaelic, you have to rein it back in and things like that. But Depends um, who's refereeing. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but <laughs> it's still not as physical at all. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I guess for me, it was probably my height and just trying to be competitive in the air. And um, again, I think across the board, like the Irish players' ability to kind of just keep working hard up and down in the field was is also, yeah, something that they look at. But since you've come back from watching the games, it seems that you've almost got a new lease of life in that you're getting around the field playing football now, Mm. maybe a little bit more than you were when you were playing before you left. And you're certainly looking for the ball a lot more in scoring opportunities. Do you think you've come back more confident? Oh, I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. Not necessarily. I don't, I actually haven't really thought of it that uh, that way at all. I feel like if anything, I've found it nearly a challenge just getting back into use the routine of, um, you know, Gaelic football and the elite level, uh, an elite level that that brings in itself. And um, obviously I was playing games whenever in Australia, but like the amount of distance I was covering on a pitch in, in an Australian AFLW game is so different to what I would have covered in an All-Ireland final last year, say for example. Um so definitely athletically and kind of like my running ability, definitely I found just a challenge at times. But I guess maybe I'm probably more aware of like ball usage and just trying to retain possession. Um, having come from Australia where like gaining ground is yeah, a huge territory. thing. So territory, I even forget the, the <laughs> language they use now that I'm home for so long. But g- yeah, gaining territory, obviously. Um, if you just kick for distance, you could end up like locking it in, as they say, down another end and trying to, you know, end up with that being a score. Whereas here we kick and you want to retain the possession. You don't want to get rid of the ball. So maybe my awareness of just little things like that and even just kicking the ball a bit more, trying to um, bring that into my game and different things like that. It's easier to kick football, is it? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't take me as long to get back into the kicking. I loved going back to my hook kick. Um, Obviously, their kind of kick is obviously like more of a punt uh, snap kick. But um, it's funny because Orla Dwyer also kicks. She kind of obviously has an Irish kick to it and they always... We're so surprised about the distance myself and Orla as Irish players could get on the ball when they kick it. We could kick it like 30, 40, 50 yards, no bother. But um, it was interesting because they're so predominantly quad when they kick it. It's obviously very quad orientated and it's more like a, I don't know even how you'd say it, but it's, yeah. Snappy. Snappy and it's, yeah, the lever that used to be quad rather than yeah. we use all hamstring when we yeah, kick. it's like or, loopy. Yeah, and it's like long levers, full extension. So um, just the different types of kicks and be even being aware of that and how you can use one to your advantage or, you know, and the other. People would be laughing at my terminology versus yours. Yeah. Snappy and loopy Snappy. versus. <laughs> I don't know said, what I said. So. Mine was very scientific. Um, <laughs> yeah. So talk to me then about the commonalities that you saw between the groups, because you said earlier, you noticed a lot of similarities when you went out initially in Brisbane <clears throat> from Dublin. And people will be interested to hear that because it's two successful mm-hmm. organisations last year. One won a championship, one won a premiership. What were the things that stood out to you? Um, I think just the kind of professionalism in the players and how they carried themselves and everyone was there and had a, everyone wanted to win and everyone wanted to be the best. Um, through both, you know, both teams, standards within the group would be quite high anyway. So, you know, just little things, arriving to training on time, how you carry yourself, how you train when you're training, you're giving it your all and different things. And also just in even post-match reviews or kind of wash-ups and stuff, even how they go about, you know, breaking down games and looking ahead to next game, looking ahead to opposition. Just all those kind of things were so similar in the way they were done. 
Um, again, obviously, possibly probably more time like given on the Australian end just because you have the luxury of time on your side. Whereas with Dublin, everyone's coming from work or training, so you have to fit it into a certain a lot of time, but we'd still get the most out of what we were doing at that um, moment. But yeah, it was interesting. I think just in general, the closeness also of the two groups. So like everyone on the Brisbane team are best friends. Everyone on my Dublin team are my closest friends, that kind of way. So when you're playing with a group of players that you've built a good relationship with off the field, I think it's transferable on the field hugely and I think that would be one big thing for the success of our Dublin team last year for sure was because we just bonded so well and as a unit same in Australia when you're playing alongside your best friends you want to win for your best friend and vice versa and you know you're going through these hard sessions doing all these hard yards of training and extra bits but it's all worth it in the end when you are successful which is I felt what the two groups you know were similar in funny like can you relate to Ailish a little bit more now given that you had that experience of going in with Brisbane where you didn't know anyone and she went in with yeah. you guys into Dublin yeah and it's funny even when I was listening to her podcast she I don't even really remember like the first few days she arrived like I feel like it was such a seamless transition and um, again I think she just came into our Dublin setup with that approach of just working hard and wanting to do all she could for the group and that's definitely what she brought to us last year and um, so similarly I think I went in you know, it's always hard being the new person. You don't want to be too shy because then you might get, you know, left to the side, but you also don't want to be too out there and outgoing because that can kind of put people off you a little bit. So I think you just have to find a good balance between the two and also be open to asking questions, open to making mistakes and things like that. And that's probably what I found, you know, hard at times. But then again, having that Irish connection in the Lions and also having a good relationship with the head coach, Craig, um, helped a lot because I felt like I could even go to him about Similar anything. to Mick, you know. Similar way. to Mick, yeah. And when you build up a relationship with someone and Mick's been, I think this is his eighth year, to, like he's all I've known in Dublin. I went in when I was 18 and he's been there, he's still there now. So I've built up a good relationship with him. And again, I feel like if you have people within a group that you you, know, you can approach and you trust, it makes such a difference. And again, you want to win for the management, you want to win for the coaching staff. And they take so much joy out of it as well because the amount of work that they put in um in Dublin or in Brisbane, it's the same and you just want to be successful for them and the joy that you give them from doing that is, yeah, really rewarding as well. People would be frustrated now hearing that because they would be asking, what are the secrets? Give us the secrets. But it's nothing crazy. Like no, it's just simple really stuff isn't. done yeah. really, really well. Yeah. It probably couldn't have went any better though. Was there any <laughs> stage throughout the season with Brisbane when you were like, surely we're not going to keep winning these games and I'm going to, like, obviously, you're not looking at the Premiership yeah. early on. You're just taking it game by game, trying to put your best foot forward. But when things were going that well, was there any part of the back of your brain that was thinking, oh, God, it's hardly going to go like this forever? Or because you're from Dublin, you know all about success, people will be saying, and you don't know any different. You just focus on the process and kept showing up and kept winning. Yeah, I think it was probably that, I guess. I've been following the lines a little bit over the few years in the lead up to possibly going. So I knew what a kind of they'd won it back in 21. And they obviously have a very good setup and a competitive group that want to be successful. They've lost the grand final the year before, lost the prelim the year before that. So they're getting to the, you know, the latter end of the season. So they know what it takes to win. But, and similarly with the Dublin setup, we've obviously been fortunate enough to get to all our finals and win all our finals in the last seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years. Um, but I guess, yeah, I just kind of took it game by game. The difference, I guess, was that it, every time I was playing a new game every week, I was learning a new rule or learning a new thing about it. Whereas with Gaelic, I feel like you go out and you don't even think about the actual logistics of the game. You obviously have certain targets you want to hit yourself, but you just go out and play. Whereas with AFLW, I feel like I had to think a lot more about what I was doing and why I was doing it. And then even in certain games, I was doing things that weren't allowed. And then I'd be like, OK, that's a rule now. Take it into the next game. Um, but I think the Irish players you have to learn quickly and adapt and yeah I just took it week by week and obviously then when we started winning near the latter end um, some of the girls would always be joking me like you could do the double here this year and I just kind of laughed and brushed it off as Irish people do um, and then suddenly we were winners or premier premiers as you'd say and yeah it was very surreal and I feel like I won't ex really appreciate it and what it is or what it was even all of last year until later in my life because it just you haven't had time no I honestly haven't really it just <laughs> has come and gone and then you just Trading. move on to the next thing so yeah it's pretty cool and obviously the memories and everything I've you know everything I've learned over the last year as well 
I hope to take with me. But as I said, it's a new year now. Everyone's back to kind of the bottom and, you know, real champions kind of go again and just try to better themselves. And that's what I think both groups that I've been involved with would want to do. Is it easier to stay present with both groups? Are there any similarities <laughs> amongst the groups even and the banter and the crack that occurs or is it very different? Um, no, similar enough. Like the Australian humour, you probably yeah. haven't gone over and experienced it. It's a little bit different to the Irish humour. So at least I was able to have a bit of a joke with Orla at times and she'd get what I was saying. But um, I think, no, across the board, like both groups are so similar in that when you're training and you're, working hard for something you have moments where you're going to take it really seriously and then you also have to have the balance of having a bit of fun and doing things or team bonding things outside of that as well and I felt like for me especially when I went to Australia having lived with the girls in the team it helped me you know get a better understanding of what they were about and I could ask them questions outside of it so um I built up relationships with girls in that team that I'm very grateful for and I think again that's attributes to um like successful teams in general do you think that's something that some counties maybe miss because at county level, the players aren't as close as you girls are with Dublin. Now, obviously you can't speak for other counties, but I was having conversations this morning about some counties, which I mm. won't name, in which there are cliques of club versus club kind of rivalries that kind of creep in to yeah. the county setup. Are you ever going to win if that's present? I don't know. It's hard, I guess. I'd imagine, and I can't, again, speak for anyone else. I think with Dublin, we have a great balance that we're ripping each other's hair out when we're playing club or even we're playing in-house games. It's very competitive and everyone's trying to break into the starting 15, if not the kind of finishing group that will probably um, make an impact on game day. So it's super competitive. Again, as I said, everyone has that competitive mindset going into training, but uh, then you can also have the crack. So for me, I think it, makes such a difference if you're close and like I'm playing with my best friends in the Dublin setup so um it makes training and going to training enjoyable and look forward to it and there's no tension or awkward awkwardness I guess so I can imagine how it might filter through and maybe you know something that causes people to maybe not want to even play with their county or step away or even as a result as you said of not being successful but for me all I can say is that I yeah I play with people that I've built like ground to know over the last few years and when you work hard with other people it makes everything and winning last year was yeah great but now you're fully focused on this year as yeah. you said a league that was I wouldn't like to put words in your mouth and I wouldn't like to preempt what you're going to say at all but somewhat successful somewhat unsuccessful because you didn't get to the final which yeah. probably was an aspiration but it's not the be all and end all so no. you probably just parked it and they're moving on. What is the focus now for the championship coming? And how easy was it to kind of just park the league? Because you did play well in instances, very, very well actually in some games, yeah. but then others probably you weren't happy with. Yeah, I guess I feel like with a new group and the turnover and like the turnover in the group with Gaelic is different in the sense that obviously people pick and choose if they want to play the following year. Um, in Australia, you're obviously contracted, so you're. But you're getting paid. Yeah, but you're locked in. You might be locked in, <laughs> yeah. so it's the expectation that you play. Whereas here, it's actually nearly a nice thing that you can decide, you know, in advance if you want to travel or if you want to take that time out. So it's always going to be challenging at the start of the year with people having come and gone and newbies coming into the group. So for us, we definitely just probably took the league, as you said, as a period of trying out a few things, trying out a few new players, and then suddenly we're getting to a stage where we actually could have ended up in a league final based on different results. So obviously disappointing not to get there, but we were actually happy probably with how we finished the league out and some Hard of our performances. Not to be happy with that result yeah. against yeah. Armagh. Yeah, now they obviously didn't put out there. They were in the final regardless, so they probably put out um, could, a different team. What could but you do about that? You have to just yeah play what's in front of you on the day. So we probably were happy to a degree, but it's it's now championship, and I feel like regardless of how well you do in the league, everyone ups their level in championship. So. We obviously want to just work hard. Um, and again, I think for us and I think the spectacle of ladies Gaelic football, we want to be a team that plays really nice football. Nice football being like, you know, fast moving and um, free flowing football where there's no real set defenses or everyone just kind of can go at it. And we pride ourselves on how we play and the standard that we put out. And we want people to be talking about the ladies game on the same kind of par as the lads game. Um, so for us, we want to just keep 
um, rising the standards within ladies Gaelic football and obviously work hard and be a really hard working team and a hard team to play against um, and yeah I guess just build on last year but um, I think any successful team works really hard and nearly outworks the opposition and that's what we try and have tried to do especially last year um, I felt like on the all Ireland final we yeah, we came out all guns blazing and we finished uh, that first half very strong, which was um, probably a credit to our S&C that has been brought up so many times, I feel, on this podcast. But yeah. Because he's a legend. Yeah. No, Sammy. And that was clear to see and that's what everybody would say. Like, you're quite an industrious team and a fast team, powerful team. And as a result of that, it enables you to play football mm-hmm. in the way that you want to play football. But... This weekend against Kildare, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, on Sunday. They're coming in following a huge yeah. win. Mm-hmm. Your guys' last fixture was a big win as well. Yeah. It's an interesting affair between yeah. Dublin and Kildare, which is traditionally a big fixture. They like to play football as well, so yeah. hopefully we see a free-flowing game. Are you excited for the weekend and what's prep looking like for the rest of the week then, if you're off today? Yeah, no, really excited. Obviously, Kildare, I think they've been un- undefeated essentially Oh, in an outrageous amount of games because obviously they went on and won the Intermediate Championship last year. Um, so they're coming in like obviously very, you know, well-equipped and they've a really good uh, group of players there and some really good forwards as well. So I guess we just have to focus on ourselves, obviously identify their threats and whatnot. But as you said, they like to play football, kind of open, expansive football as well. So I'd imagine it'll be quite a open game, which I, and I think everyone would rather play than play against a team that's going to, park people behind the ball and things like that because that brings its own challenges at times but yeah um, training this week Wednesday and Friday so we'll just look ahead to that and I think it's really exciting we've had a few weeks off now to just kind of regroup and we were given a week off as well just to kind of do our own thing which was nice as well because as I said for something that's not a paid profession you give so much of your time to county setups and it does become part of your life so it is nice to also get time off so that was lovely to get just even a week away and uh, yeah, look forward to this weekend. And then, as I said, it'll kind of roll in quite quickly from there with Leinster Championship into the All-Ireland Series. So um, yeah, really looking forward to it. Does your time off differ at all here versus what it does in Australia if they give you the day off or I don't know if they'd even give you a week off in Oz? Um, yeah, just a little bit. I think on my days off in Oz, I went to the beach and <laughs> got to... You go to the beach here. Well, I can go to the beach here. It's a little bit colder. Um, days off in Oz, obviously you go down to the beach or just, yeah, enjoy your time off. But it was similar in that um, you just want to take it easy, look after your body and not get up to anything too strenuous. So hopefully now, you know, the weather's getting a little bit better here. As we keep saying, fingers, fingers crossed. crossed, it'll get, yeah, <laughs> it'll get a bit nicer. But uh, yeah, on your days off, obviously just relaxing and looking after yourself. Because as I said, it's, everyone goes to work and has a job here. So it's really important, I guess, when you do have, even a few hours of time just to look after yourself and yeah, mind your body because we don't have the luxury of probably yeah, having more time to take it easy as you would ever in Australia. Loads of people are going to Australia at the moment from Ireland. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. It heaps like it's actually, it is mental. And I have plans to go back obviously as well, but yeah. there are aspects of Australian culture that I love and some mm-hmm. that I don't love as much. Yeah. What surprised you most about going out and why would you tell somebody to move to Australia or give somebody advice that they should move to Australia? Um, yeah, I don't know. I think, yeah, I realised having gone over and you were there as well, how many Irish there are, you turn and corner. Now, Brisbane was a bit quieter, um, which was actually nearly nice because it, I actually nearly was forced, as an, in a team environment, forced to spend time with Australian people. But when I went down to Sydney... You're going down by Kudji or whatever yeah. and it's you just GA shorts and county colours everywhere. Um, you actually can't escape it. But no, I guess I think the opportunity to travel, see that part of the world is just so enticing for people. I guess I'm obviously 24 now and I feel like a lot of people in that mid-20s age are just at the point where with COVID and stuff, we didn't probably get a chance to travel and a few years were put on hold. So everyone's just kind of taking that opportunity now, having worked maybe a year or two of normal life again to just travel and I think there's some people that are given out about the Irish all going over and some people um, that are so so for it. Um, one of the Australian girls asked if we were in a war um, 
why as to why there's so many Irish they said they were like what's going on over in Ireland like why is everyone leaving and we were like oh just can't get enough of this good weather and in fairness that is the main thing and I think the lifestyle and just even mentally to have a completely different outlook on life um, and how you can spend your time doing different things and just more of a outdoorsy vibe which I loved because you know here I try to be outdoors as much as I can but you know the weather and the lifestyle over here doesn't lend to that as much but um yeah I think it is pretty cool but at the same time I was saying to you off air like I'm such a home bird so I found the initial few weeks really really challenging and um even when I go back over later in the year I will probably find that time really hard again because you grow to love and you know enjoy spending time with people that you're just used to and it's like your comfort zone um so leaving was definitely a challenge and I think I will always be drawn back to here regardless of how many times I go back to Australia I think home is is Dublin for me and it's probably um yeah something that'll my family and friends here will probably constantly be pulling on my heartstrings as you'd say um but I think Australia for now is great and I do think it's a cool country super cool super cool yeah Yeah. (laughs) so is it just people really that you struggled with not having them there when you went out or is there any aspects of Australian culture that you just can't get with whatsoever? Um, there wasn't actually much that I couldn't really get with. Um, or that um, you didn't enjoy, maybe. Not necessarily. Like I was in a team environment and spent most of my time with that group of people 24-7. So I think the challenge was that at the start when I was a newbie trying to find myself within that team and where I fit and how people viewed you and gaining trust of players around that group was probably what I found the hardest engaging people and what they thought and how Australians as a whole probably carry themselves and like as Irish we're quite similar in many ways so it was definitely interesting trying to get to know engage an Australian person and whether they're in a good mood bad mood or you know that kind of thing but because I went into an environment within a team I I kind of it was something I was familiar with from home so it helped me a huge amount So definitely the family and friends thing. And I think just not being able to pick up the phone or call someone at any time of the day. Um, Or even if I'd had like a poor training session or just found something hard that day and I just wanted to chat to my mom or chat to one of my friends, look at the world clock on your phone and it's three in the morning. So um, yeah, definitely challenging from that end, just trying to even keep up to date with people. And you probably came to realize as well when you're trying to talk to people on a regular basis, back home it's actually not feasible I joke to all my friends saying once I'm gone like check it every now and again but it's hard to maintain like consistent contact and vice versa now that I'm back in Ireland I'm chatting to the Australian girls every now and again but it's nothing you know outrageously regular because everyone's so busy and you're on different time frames completely it's a phone call or voice notes yeah number one like voice notes are good just keeping up telling them what's yeah. going on it's a nice touch. Some people don't like voice notes. Yeah. Too bad. Uh, they work for me in yeah. my schedule, so I'll be sending them. But it sounds like you're very fully focused on your sport. Yeah. But you you said you do have a nice time away <clears throat> from sport in that like you do have your time to go for coffees, go for swims yeah. and, and have a break. But having a lot of your best friends playing sport as well. Yeah. Do you find ever that it does come become a little bit monotonous at times and sometimes you need a break from it completely. And then how do you get that break? Yeah, definitely probably maybe coming home to uh, like the setup here and going straight back into it. I probably have come to realise that my life does revolve a lot around sport. I don't think I would at the moment or I wouldn't change anything I've done or change what I have now. And I'm so grateful for the opportunities that have been presented to me and not everyone gets an opportunity to play for their county and then get an opportunity to go over and play in Australia. So like it'd be silly of me to be given out about it but as you said it is a lot and sometimes it is nice to kind of just take a break I feel like last year probably was the first year I kind of nearly went 12 months of non-stop activity sports wise so that in itself brought its own challenges um obviously I was given a little bit more time before going back to Dublin this year which was nice as well but um yeah you'd wonder how sustainable it is you know going forward and I think for me it's just about I have friends outside of sport and school friends that um, I've kept in contact with which are great and just having outlets of different things that are outside of sport completely or even if I do meet up with some of the girls that I play with Dublin with you know we go do something else or go for dinner and don't talk about you know the team and what's coming up and things like that and I think trying to find a balance between that is helpful as well because it can it consumes a lot of your life already so if you're talking about it again at home or 
outside of training hours, it can, yeah, become overwhelming. Do you find there's more of an emphasis placed on it and maybe more resources provided to switch off in Australia towards here where if you're playing football, like needs to be your life, needs to be sleeping, eating, breathing it, don't think about anything else, don't talk about anything else. And yeah. as we were speaking about earlier, mm. don't put anything on social media. I know. Whereas over there, it's like put everything on social media. Yeah, it's yeah, it's just, it's interesting. It's so different because yeah, again, inter-county stuff here, being a non-professional setup yet, everything is behind closed doors. Like you train, no one knows what you're doing at training. And if anyone rocks up and walks past, it's like, what are you doing here? This is a closed, you know, setup. Yeah. And it's funny because where we train in Australia in Brisbane, any regular Joe can walk past on a walk and there's no bother with them sitting around standing and whatnot. So it's just, again, I think it just comes back to us as Irish people and how we carry ourselves and what, I don't know, what we what we do and how we yeah, go about our business. Um, which is, yeah, interesting because even chatting to like Sinead Goldrick who plays with Melbourne and she says they train over there and like you probably went to a completely public park yep. and the Collingwood men's team who just won the premiership last year who are these professional athletes that people would be starstruck to see on the street are just kicking a ball around in a regular field whereas you know and the, the Swans do the exact same yeah. thing in Sydney like. and then you have even us in our setup we're training in a Jim McGuinness is putting a wall around I know a gated a gated community nearly but it's just what we know and how we yeah, how what we're used to. Um, but it is funny to see because it's two completely contrasting ways of going about it. But then both, you know... Both are right in their own yeah, right. And both have... But they can probably learn a little bit from the other one, I think. Yeah. Especially if we're worried about attendances at games, I think we yeah. probably need to be a little bit more open in what we disclose. Mm-hmm. And that's why we're here talking about it, I suppose. Yeah. And we're being open. And yeah. you're, as you said before the podcast, you're giving away what you want and not giving away yeah. what you don't want to give away. But yeah, again, yeah. And then I guess that that's the thing over here. Trying to promote the game is so important. And I think exposure to the ladies game especially is huge and how we're trying to push that even across the board. And for me, I think it's just super important that people even talk about ladies football or um, are in the know with what games are going on and what's happening. And even if there's a game on at the weekend, hearing little kids or even young boys in the school that I'm working at asking what game you have this weekend Miss Dunn different things like that and it shouldn't be the way but when you have little lads asking about ladies games you know you're coming you know you're coming along Um, and again I know the Leinster ladies final is going to be in Crow Park the same day as the lads final so whoever ends up there whether that be us or another team in Leinster it's another opportunity to have two games on and hopefully get good crowds at it but I think there should be more things and more opportunities for like double headers and things like that over here and I heard people talking about it in Australia as well and how it could also lend to huge success in the promotion of the game over there because AFLW is only in its eighth year. Um, whereas the lads game's in, I don't even know how many years. But it's also on that same trajectory nearly where you're trying to promote the game. So that's another huge similarity. They're still pushing to get um, as much as the lads because as great as it is getting paid, they're not getting as much as the lads. And there's disparity in both, which is, yeah, mad to think. But it it will improve for sure because if you look at the average attendances of mm-hmm. all of the clubs in the AFLW they're all on the rise mm-hmm. whereas if you looked at the average attendances in the GAA sure we might be getting more numbers to the bigger games yeah. but is there a significant increase in those other games maybe the rounds of the league and whatnot? and I think there are a number of things that need to be worked on coverage of the games is great on TG Cahar probably need a little bit more of it and we probably need a separate channel as well because it clashes with the men's all yeah. the time Yeah, and as well as that I think from what we were talking about off air as well I think a lot of the female athletes and and the ladies Gaelic footballers are a lot more clued in into the power of uh, building a personal brand and actually putting things out there and going and speaking to people and building a buzz around the sport than yeah. maybe the men are which yeah. is a good thing, yeah. but it's because it's necessary because yeah. we need to get it up to the same level as the lads. Yeah, I think the quicker both parties, not that they're separate because we're amalgamating GAA now, yeah. but realise that, look, we need to have a big push on getting more eyes on it because this is our national sport. Yeah. And we should be raising this up and not putting it behind closed doors, the better. Yeah. And I think that's something that the Australians get really, really right. Yeah. Um, but maybe sometimes they give away a little bit too much. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. And I think, again, it's 
going to take time and hopefully the amalgamation of the GA, LGFA and Camogie Association will, you know, help that hugely. Um, even the two Camogie games being on in Crow Park yesterday, even just for And primetime RTE as yeah, well. Yeah, that's what I mean. The exposure of the game and getting those games shown on RTE is huge. So little things like that obviously are super helpful. Um, the only thing I would say, I guess, is because we're not a professional setup and sometimes training or playing games on a Sunday afternoon or a bank holiday mm. Monday for viewing rights on Teach Cahir can be at its own difficulties in that I think nearly all ladies games should be tried to, or any game should try to be played on a Saturday evening or a Saturday daytime just because of recovery on the other end and there's people not going to work on a Monday but then the debate of whether you should have Friday night games but then everyone's coming from a job so things yeah. like that pros and cons I guess to both but I guess for me, we've probably had to play a few games on a bank holiday Monday. So that means you're waiting around Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Playing at four o'clock on a bank holiday Monday isn't great in no. promoting and enticing the game for girls because you want to, you know, enjoy the games, but also then maybe have a weekend day off as well to recover and things like that. But, but I think Friday night is the way to go. And I know yeah. what you're going to say, but... Well, you I and also, me both know the feeling of rushing across town to yeah. make a Dublin uh, training league session. or championship well, game yeah, with club on a Wednesday night yeah. or on a Friday. And it, it is a nightmare, I know. but you do get there yeah, and you do play. yeah, And it doesn't make that much of an impact. No, You know you're playing game, away, so you, yeah. you leave work early. Like. Yeah, and the game gets played. And I think over in Australia, the Thursday and Friday night games get huge traction. And then as a result, you'd have a longer recovery. But I guess... Again, as you said, everyone's working a job, so it's probably not as feasible. And I guess with us in Dublin, it's all right. But if you're traveling from Dublin to another county or things like that, it adds its own challenges. But I, I can tell you safely, it's easier <laughs> to drive from the top of Tipperary to the bottom at rush hour than it is to drive from the north side to the south side or south side to the north side. Yeah, and sure, well, we train the north side always, so the south siders get the, the short straw with that. But again, if you need to be there at six, you know, you just have to filter in time and you will change your day accordingly because you know you have to be there at a certain time and you put your priorities in a certain way to align with that so yeah. so let's do it let's get Friday yeah, night games going <laughs> okay quick four questions to finish Jen yeah proudest achievement to date um it'd be hard not to say either of the last two that I kind of was involved with I think the all Ireland win with Dublin was a huge thing considering where we came from and we lost a lot of players the previous year. So the journey we as a group made and as I said, playing alongside some girls that I've played with for a good few years, it was very sweet and there was almost a sense of just relief and accomplishment that we weren't the favourites. So that's um, that's up there. And then I think, yeah, pretty cool in the sense that I went over and started a sport that I had never played. And then four months later, I'm on a premiership winning team. So um, yeah, either of those two really um, for different reasons. but Or both together. Yeah, that's true. They both the first. They You're the first. Yeah. <laughs> the first. As everybody's told you, I'm yeah. sure. Again, but that's something that people say to me and it kind of just goes over my head. But uh, again, as I said, try to build on them and yeah, it'd be cool to be the only one to do the double double, if you get me. But uh, yeah, so just start afresh and go at it again this year, I guess. Favourite athlete of all time? Um, oh, there was a few like, I love Steph Curry, random one, but I actually would have played basketball a good bit in school. So yeah, um, I've always admired him. And then I think Nadal, tennis, also played tennis when I was younger. And I feel like those kind of sports and what he does, even especially on clay courts, is insane. And his, I saw his winning rate or whatever on clay is like 90 odd percent. So the, even the ability he has um, in, an, in, in an individual sport to, you know, break through those mental barriers that I think a lot of players have um, is insane and very admirable because I don't know if I'd be able to do that in an individual setup. I think that's why team setups for me are why I like being successful and I think I'd crumble in an individual sport. <laughs> I don't know though, work rate wise maybe you're up there with Nadal because that's oh. generally why he's yeah. winning on clay is because he's just... Yeah, mentally maybe I'd slip down a little bit. <laughs> I think you're being modest there. You've, oh. You're you going to do the double-double coming up you obviously as you just said. So <laughs> we'll see if that happens but yeah. hopefully, fingers crossed. What's the biggest thing that you've learned in the last 12 months? Um, We've touched on it already but just being that present and kind of appreciating the moment that you're in and accepting it for what it is when I'm here in Ireland, you know, taking every day as it come and being grateful for that and what comes with that. And then obviously when I'm in Australia also, you know, living life to, to the fullest as such because 
I don't know how many people or how long I'll be able to live this life and have the opportunities that I have at this moment. So just enjoying it and kind of, yeah, really being in the moment, I'd say. Well, you're smashing it. Keep it up. Last one. Yeah. What would you tell your 18 year old self? Um, I was thinking about this. You just got in with Dublin actually at 18. Yeah, at 18, well. leaving cert year. Um, probably just even looking back is not to be afraid of getting stronger even from like a gym S&C background um, like we've had young girls come in this year and really take them well to the gym obviously it's hard at the start but for me I never had any exposure to that at 18 prior to the Dublin setup I probably went through the motions a little bit at the start but not being afraid or like you know feel out of your comfort zone going into the gym as most young 18 year olds do but just understanding that being strong and being you know a good female athlete requires you to get those things are done in the gym so I think looking back even I have 19 year old sisters now and just telling them to you know go down and there's like this taboo about I think females especially in club setups I'm not sure what it's like but my sisters are terrified to go into the gym at home just because they might meet a lad or you know different things like that whereas men are always up here on it and girls maybe not so much so definitely for my 18 year old self just kind of just go at it and not be afraid to get stronger because I think the way the game's going now in both competitions being fast and being strong hold you in very good stead for um, how you go to play the game awesome I love that end to the podcast yeah Jen thanks a million for thank coming you. on it's been class thanks Mel. thank you <laughs>